So, yeah. So I'll introduce about ourselves and I myself serve as the faculty here. And we have about three researchers uh, with us. And uh, Sanjay Biswas, he works on uh, device to device communication here. And uh, actually, other two are present here. Uh, and, but their research interests are more on uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and mobile edge computing. So we have a few PhD students here. Uh, 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 first, Thorindu, he works on wireless information and power transfer. And Udara Samaratunga, he works on uh, non orthogonal multiple access techniques for 5G communication. So the next, next other person is Rabi Akash, he's not present here. And our term also not present. And uh, now we shall my actually is a visiting PhD student that will come to us. And there is one master student as well, uh, Alexander Kodoshova. So they are the kind of team that we have here. We focus on various uh, aspects of uh, wireless communications. So uh, I mean, I will just give a brief introduction about what are the other main focus of our lab. Uh, first, we, uh, we uh, focus on device-to-device -device communication or user-centric communication uh, which make uh, like a switching between the base station-centric and device-centric communication and in Sanjay's talk, he will present more detailed introduction. And we are also interested in for LDPC and polar core designs. Uh, myself, I worked in the past more on uh, LDPC for design for wireless communication, and now we kind of thinking to use polar codes with some of our colleagues in uh, University of Eindhoven. So uh, another aspect is uh, cooperative relay communication. In this, we actually more look at the physical lay angle of uh, uh, processing of the relay. And we create, uh, I mean, uh, relay uh, protocols. Uh, and uh, like, a, as we know, there are two main uh, traditional relay protocols, like decode and forward relay, and amplify and forward relay. So uh, apart from this, we we recently proposed a uh, new algorithm, which is which actually not us, but we made an uh, agreement to that. It's called lossy forwarding. In the lossy forwarding, I will explain in my slides what we did. So let me go to the next one, and the next one is ultra-dense network. In the ultra-dense network, uh, as we know, uh, with the, as the number of connected devices increases, there is a huge demand for uh, uh, coverage and the data rates and the energy. So with the introduction of a small cells, uh, I mean, people introduce ultra-dense network, what we try to do here is to use uh, ultra-dense bronze network, like we are trying to replace the small cells and add drones and the cloud here and trying to see whether uh, traditional uh, drawbacks of the small cells can be mitigated through uh, UAVs. But UAV also introduced certain uh, constraints. And as I said, unmanned vehicles, uh, aerial vehicles or the quadcopters also is, is like a start, a start up project that we have with one of our postdocs. And his uh, more interests are on uh, upper layers and with the IoT devices. Uh, and the caching in wireless networks, I have uh, I mean, kind of started doing it with a colleague at uh, Nanjing University of Science and Technology. And I also informed actually about your coming that he's also, I think he has also some collaboration with Shanghai, uh, who I sent. Uh, with Professor uh, Wen Chen. Yeah, I think he's a PhD student of Professor Wen Chen. Uh, so in the caching, we, uh, one of the recent work includes that we use a matching theory to estimate the popular content and then we share, we store them in the local clouds and then we kind of look into the optimization angle uh, and, uh, and the four designs. And next one is RF wireless power transfer. There are a lot more actually. I mean, that's that we do with uh, our PhD students. We kind of thinking of uh, starting new areas which are quite progressive at the moment. So in RF uh, uh, wireless power transfer, as well as simultaneous uh, information and power transfer, we look into the uh, physical layer perspective of uh, designing self-powered nodes because. Um, it's actually
while RF wireless power transfer has been uh, there are quite uh, I mean more than 50 decades, but quite recently there is a pickup uh, by I mean this uh, progressive community uh, to uh, to see whether it can help for energy sustainability. But also we know um, traditionally there is an issue with the energy transfer efficiency because the transfer efficiency is very small. And we apply this uh, technique in the cooperative relay communication and to see uh, whether we can, we can uh, improve the uh, overall energy consumption that needs to provide by the direct power supply. So user-centric approaches I mentioned, and this is uh, also it's quite related, simultaneous wireless information and power transfer, and then uh, we are also working on dynamo orthogonal multiple access technique for 5G with Udara. And uh, uh, we have a couple of approaches to this. The first one is we, uh, in the recent work, we kind of, uh, we, uh, uh, we amalgamate IFDM and the NOMA and we kind of propose a new algorithm called successive band division NOMA, SPD NOMA because we divided the available spectrum to different chunks and in each chunk we did, did the NOMA and then we kind of tried to improve the sum rate and the fairness. So, I mean, I, I, okay. So this is one example of cooperative relay communication uh, that we did quite recently. Uh, uh, so here we have, we have got like a two users and one destination. So the two users transmit signals maybe we can do like simultaneous using physical layer network coding or using the network coding and then the, uh, at the receiver they compute the received signal like we use LLR and then we uh, soft network coded them okay uh, especially this technique is very useful when the source to relay channel is really poor because if you are using a decode and forward technique uh, and if you make a decision at the relay uh, that will be erroneous and forwarding those signals to the destination will result in like we destroying the quality of service or the error rates. So in this case what we do is we don't make any decision, instead we forward probabilistic information from the relay to the destination. Uh, and then the res uh, destination knows what is the reliability level of the received signal and thus it can make a decision accordingly. So in this way we try to improve the uh, diversity order of the overall system even at a poor uh, channel condition. I know it's too much to say in a few minutes, I hope we just get the overall picture. So there are the specific research areas of cooperative uh, wireless network that we are working at present. So one is the lossy forwarding, actually lossy forwarding means when the relay also encountered errors, we still forward to the destination. And then uh, we are kind of looking into the new modulation scheme because if you forward this uh, probabilistic information to the destination, they are like an analog kind of signal. And uh, in a recent idea that we propose is to use angular type of modulation. <laughs> and then we we'll also uh, like to work on LDPC code design for a multi-user relay and optimize the codes. Uh, and then uh, physical layer network coding in LDPC coded schemes. So these are some of our contributions that we made. Uh, so then uh, normal technique I'll just briefly explain. So uh, as we know, uh, OFDM has been there for uh, for a half uh, century almost. And recently the community was uh, interested in to look into new multiple access technology. So uh, in, the, in the NOMA what we do is we allocate uh, different power levels to the users and in downlink then we can see that the two users are superimposed and then we will transmit the signal. So the, uh, the, it has got two power levels about the same frequency and then we increase the uh, spectral efficiency here. So at the receiver, uh, so, the, so the receiver which locates near, it has an interference, so we will do the successive interference cancellation and then here we do the signal decoding at the receivers. So this is something we did quite recently, some of our recent work. So here we have in general, in the, in the uh, traditional scheme of OFDM, that's like uh, the spectrum is divided between the users and that's the norma here. In the norma, uh, so we have a spectrum, I mean the spectrum, but we 
with the many users packed in this spectrum. So what we do is we divide the spectrum and then we allocate fixed number of users to the each band. So like we said, uh, norma 2, norma 2 means like 2 users in each and norma 4 means 4 users in the each uh, like a block of frequencies packed in together. So this is one of the uh, a way, I mean one of the advantages we kind of uh, manage the interference level because here we experience really high difference. And then when we compare, compare the uh, sub capacity that we, we observe that we can receive quite high sub capacity but still the norma is the best but the trade-off is uh, uh, interference level and again we compute an energy uh, uh, sorry. Yes, uh, um, energy efficiency of the uh, system of FDM and norma and the SBD norma. So the traditional scheme is in the bottom line in terms of energy efficiency and the norma is the best one and but still we get to some level by our proposal scheme of SBD norma. So there are some of research interests that we have in uh, NOMA. So I'll quickly run if I'm running for too much time. And these are some of our contributions that we made in this angle. So there are, I mean, I just highlighted two areas just for explanatory purpose. Yes, sir. For multiple access, you mostly focus on nothing, right? Yes, yes. Oh, uh, not really. I mean, no, we have not focused on the downlink so far. Uh, uh, but I think could be uh, we could use uh, a similar approach uh, with some more alternatives. Uh, we haven't uh, done downlink so far. And uh, so, just to showcase some of our uh, current act activities of our group, so uh, we are calling application, I mean, papers on like various uh, journals. I mean, some of our team members are associated with, as editors. And we also organize a workshop on smart cities at uh, PIMRC Montreal in Canada in October 2017. So we also provided you CFP in case if you want to contribute. Uh, some of our future plans, actually I need to go to one of the slides up, but uh, that's some of our uh, future plans here. Yeah, so one of our future plans is to establish a TPU Lisbon double degree PhD program in our area. So uh, there's a new in in initiative of our lab with the help of Maxime, our chair, and the International Cooperation uh, Unit of our university. So in this uh, double degree program, our students can spend part of uh, their study time in the uh, University of New Lisbon, and their students can come to our lab and spend maybe a year or plus. So the students will get uh, two degrees, and they have to make only a, a one a thesis defense. Uh, so uh, one of the advantages the students will benefit by the joint supervision and it also uh, provides a platform for our students to access uh, new projects and the infrastructure facility of uh, Lisbon. So currently this is at the final stage of signing and the rectors and we are hoping to start in, in a couple of months. So that's one of our initiatives and <coughs> so let me quickly run to the other things, what we do here, uh, uh, yes, we also want to present, uh, I mean, we are, as I said, we are a startup group, so it's kind of a new skill, and we are doing, I mean, looking for a lot of funding, and also, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we are doing a lot of recruitment campaigns to attract uh, talented guys here, so we want to present us as a center of excellence in wireless communication. I know it is a big goal to have, but <laughs> probably in Tomsk we will do it uh, soon. So we also want to present an application for a mega grant with the leading scientists from the uh, University of Alberta. And uh, uh, also we are interested in to strengthen our research collaboration 
and industrial links with uh, various entities like maybe uh, Huawei. Uh, also, we have a lot of actually uh, collaborations with foreign universities at present. We are also hoping to launch a uh, MSc program in wireless communication and networks with the partner university in the future. Uh, so, uh, apart from the listed uh, directions, and we are kind of interested in looking into uh, like other uh, areas of wireless communication like machine volume and uh, physical security and the fog and edge computing. <coughs> so these are the current projects uh, that are running at present here. Uh, we also form part of the cost action of uh, 5G communication. Uh, actually we are only member in, in Russia which present cost action. And they are the academic collaborators that we work quite uh, closely and uh, we, we, we do a lot of research with them and uh, we have a lot of uh, joint publications. Uh, okay. Okay. So I just put uh, one more slide about <laughs> with the Huawei what we so far did uh, or doing at the moment. So I think um, one of uh, one of the uh, officials at Huawei Moscow Center sent us this HIRP uh, proposal. So uh, we are preparing a couple of, couple of proposals, one in massive mind mode and another one in edge computing. Uh, so we are also working with Luis uh, Suarez, uh, that's how actually we got the contacts, we should <laughs> thank him, <laughs> at least I, and uh, yeah. So these are the things uh, I will, uh, that will conclude my talk. No, uh, we will submit, I think, on uh, 15th. <coughs> yes, yes, this week, yes. That's already drafted, but tomorrow we will polish it and uh, submit. Uh, okay, so that's all for me, and uh, we would like to invite uh, Sanjay Biswas, a uh, postdoctoral research scientist. He will talk about the device device networks.
if we are implementing the device centric communication or non centric communication we need a dramatical change over the communication system like what we have right now we need a change and this change is going on correctly in 2016 and 18 maybe it will be implemented or i don't know the current status and <coughs> the people are working in this balance between the quality of service and experience towards find this objective what are the research objectives we may can face the first one is a green and soft aspect right now the cellular communication consume lot of amount of the energy as per the survey 60% of the energy is consumed by the mobile network infrastructure and 40% used by for the communication so we need a systematic balance of this so minimum energy consumption and better performance next one is technical challenges still we are doing the OFDM and we are doing the dealing with the two tower architecture and hlr we are dealing with this kind of the databases now we need a change of the technical system we have the data concept we have the concept of iot we have the concept of 5g we need to shift from the old technology to the new technology as well as the network densification for example here we are sitting the 20 people but it might be possible only one base station is serving to all people sometimes the base station may be overloaded we need to change between the network densification if the network is dense somehow we need to switch the user to another base station or we need a different kind of the base station services and to achieve these kind of <coughs> research objective we are facing these challenges our current network and current devices are not capable to handle these technical regulations and there is no such standards and regulation body that are good for 5G network and we are overlapping of the traditional technologies we have the base backbone of the traditional technology but our new technologies are not capable to handle those kind of things for example as Nalin told <coughs> OMD is old technology and now they are applying to NOMA it has some problems but we are not able to handle these kind of issues to what encapsulated these kind of things we are working with these two domains energy efficient user safety cooperative communication and quality of service and quality of experience like mobility management Right now, we are working in these two working domains. The first work is energy aware user centric communication, and it is a mode switching technology where if the current performance of the user is poor, the cellular communication is fine. If the performance of the network is good, the mobile user will switch to the device mode. If the performance of the user is clear, to, uh, high, then it will follow the traditional communication. It has a dynamic, it has a dynamic relay management system, and this offers the less signaling overhead compared to the legacy network like the 4G and LTE, and it has less energy consum consumption with high user mobility, movement probability. So this is the basic algorithm. <coughs> what we are doing? First, it will take when the mobile user is connected to the base station, it will forward the beacon signal to the base station. For this data system, we can identify the current cell ID of the current cell ID of the correspondent node and what it will perform, it will perform the mode switching and it will compute the only three things current cell ID of the corresponding node, current cell ID of the uh, mobile user If the current cell ID is same as the uh, cell ID of the UE, means source and target, both are the same then perform the device mode Device mode is where the call is switched from the cellular mode to the device mode of communication. If it is not, then follow the traditional mode. And between this switching, we are if the performance is less during the device mode, if the performance is less, we can add a relay node. That RM function is a relay mode function, and it will also continue uh, compute the performance of the UE. If the performance of the UE is higher than the pre-designed threshold, then only we can continue the device mode, otherwise it will follow the traditional cellular mode. And this is the algorithm for the dynamic relay management. In this relay management, we will compute the signal strength of the UE to corresponding node and the signal strength from this corresponding node to E node B. And initially we are assuming there is no relay node is required and if the signal strength of <coughs> sorry, UE to E node B as signal strength of the corresponding node to E node B and the signal strength between the U e, 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 relay to E node B is greater than the threshold value then we will perform the relay uh, device mode otherwise we will follow with the cellular mode and here there is a dynamic relay management if 
initially you can observe the area load is zero. If the performance is less, then we will add a area load. If performance is uh, poor, uh, there is no need of the area load. And it will be continued up to the threshold where it is defined by the users or service provider. Throughout the procedure, we can divide two parts, this procedure in two parts. The first one is the node initiation, next one is the network initiation. What a node can do? A node can initiate a call. This call is <coughs> forwarded to the network. Network will observe the performance measurement and it will get back. If it is required, a target node, uh, relay node may be added or during the relay node, the network will observe again and for the performance. And the relay node is also managed by the network. So here there are three meetings in the in node initiation, call initiation, target node and the relay node. In the second part, there is in the node initiation, the performance measurement is taken by the network service provider and the network management is also provided by the service provider and the relay management is also given to take care by the service provider. <coughs> and this is the result. Here we are consume, uh, plotting the consumed energy and the user movement probability and the number of the cell crossing. This factor is very important in user movement probability. <coughs> there are two kinds of the movement. One movement is a linear movement, another is a spin movement. It might be possible a user is rotating in a particular cell. So he is also moving. At the same time, his point of attachment is changing. And this, meanwhile, he can distance from one area to another area. This movement probability covers those two kinds of the movement. One is the linear movement as well as the rotation movement. And you can observe our proposed work has a very good performance compared to the LTE network. This one is device mode and this was the relay mode and this one is the LTE mode. And the next one is for the plot for movement probability and number of EV and consumed energy. <coughs> Our next work is mobility management for qualitative experience in 5G network. It is an extension of the work, previous work. In the first one we are dealing with the only energy. Here we are dealing with the several other parameters like mobility management, call to mobility ratio and <coughs> high degree of the user mobility. It has a two part. Two is if observe the schema, here the, in the pre, recapitulate the previous schema, in the previous schema it is a two way communication. Here it is one way. Network will analyze the performance and it will analyze the quality of experience and quality of service. If anything is go wrong, it will move to the device mode, it will move to the cellular mode, it will be it can select the rail and it may observe the relay management. <coughs> here the mode switching algorithm is modified. Here mode switching algorithm will compute the signal distance and bandwidth. And if the performance is less than the threshold value, then user mode will continue. Otherwise the cellular mode will continue. And the performance we are computing three parameters, energy, delay and bandwidth. And this one is mobility management. In the mobility management, if node is changed, the current threshold is very high, so we will again move to the device mode. Otherwise, the cellular mode will continue. And how we will implement? There are three basic technologies what we are trying to implement. Hardware design and its methodology we are trying to implement in the hardware with the program USB. As well, we are trying to implement with the hardware like uh, base station devices of mobile user can be work connected with their system level simulation and mathematical analysis. And some possible collaborations where we can collaborate, we, uh, collaborate, we can collaborate in machine to machine communication, file error and map error issue, energy efficient Wi-Fi directs, channel modulation, including control mechanism in D2D, cooperative relay management, there are other possible area where we can work together. Some basic results, what you produce here, we have a couple of publications regarding this. Okay. If you have any question, you can ask. Questions? I have some many questions. Just say, please go to the page 8, number 8. Whenever we have a mobile user, it must be connected to the base station. 
so that we can identify the exact position of the user. And this process is called the location registration and location update. And when the call is initiated, assume that the call is initiated by UE6, it, it wants to come connect with the UE5. Now, the, it, it already connected to the base station, base station node, it is a target node, target node is UE5. It will compute the cell ID of the UE6 as well as the cell ID of the UE5. If both are the same, then first initiation will go to the, they will try to move in the device mode, so that they can communicate directly. There is no need of the control mechanism over the network. Only base station will handle because in the NTE, base stations are intelligent. So they can directly communicate. If the performance is poor, they will add a relay node like this. Here the UE8 is a relay node. Okay. okay. But if, if UE5 was reconnected to the base station. Okay. For, 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 but it has a bad performance? But in fact, the bad performance will direct a dynamic node. A random node will be selected as a relay node. Again, the performance will be measured. If the performance is poor, move to the cellular node. If performance is good, connect with the device. Yeah, but, but uh, for example, I am UE number 6, uh -huh. and maybe I don't want to spend my battery life for UE5. So UE5, okay. If you compare, this device communication has less energy because there are only some signal exchange. If you are following the traditional communication, for a single message sending, it takes at least 24 half of the communication. That is far, far less than this. Here I think 5 or 6 signal exchange. If you are following the traditional communication, 24. 4 times 5 times 5 and the normal system. Can I tell you some estimation how we can increase coverage of the cell? Sorry? Coverage of the cell. Coverage of the cell? Yes, my dear. Okay. Um, this is the one part of the uh, cutting edge technology of the network densification. In the first slide, I think I have talked about the network densification. Yeah, yeah. The network densification of the modern area. Where in the past, uh, in the current technical system, we are not aware about the, how much crowd will be here. Suppose, for example, now we are 20 people in a single room. But the base station you know, may not be capable to handle 20 people in a single instance. But in the 5G, we have a, some device-based communication. So that the device can work like a base station. Or a front cell based network or any kind of the home device can work that way. So it's an undergoing work of the 5G revolution. But anyway, we need some coordinator. Yeah, we need some coordinator. Yes, we need the coordinator. Base station will monitor. Base station will not perform the all tasks <coughs> that now the base station will need. He will, the basic objective is we want to reduce the workload of the base station. This is our basic objective of the file. Yeah, then the last question to this concept. Uh, because uh, if we tell now a distributed network that maybe some macro cell uh -huh. has fun, main function, its coordination function, but there is uh, some delay between nodes, different nodes and cell and macro cell. Yes. Right? Yes. 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 Scale probably several milliseconds, uh -huh. maybe up to 10 milliseconds. Yes, yes. And such latency between uh, hmm. different nodes. Yeah, so yes. What is the impact on the computer? Yeah, this is a very good question. Here, if we go through the algorithm, the algorithm, the algorithm, there is one factor delay. We will compute this delay and we are comparing this delay with the threshold value. And we are taking this threshold as in 45 microseconds. If this 45 microsecond delay is less than the 45, higher than the 45 microsecond, we are transferring the call to the traditional mode. Otherwise, we will follow the device mode. Uh, another question? Yeah, sure. About the what is the definition for network mobility management? Network mobility management. Yeah. For example, I have this mode, mobile. Right now, I am connected with this base station. Okay? If I am moving in a circular motion, now the mobile, I am mobile. Sometime I am getting the poor signal from this base station and I am getting the higher signal to this. So when I am moving from this area to this area, I will connect it here. Okay? Okay, it's a handover. It's a handover. At same time, there is a linear movement. Now if I am rotating continuous rotation, in the continuous rotation, I am also moving. The moment, there is a movement, but there is no handover. Yes, yes. 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 Yes.
No, no, not yet. We are doing with the uh, this MATLAB and we are trying to build up with some hardware. Yeah, Yes, everything is on the MATLAB simulation. Right. Unfortunately. <laughs> and we are trying to implement with them programmable USB and some hardware. So we apply for uh, some devices. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Purchase some devices so that dummy game station, dummy mobile devices, so that we can connect and check out the performance, exact performance. And the, 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 the department has some maybe cluster. Yes, we, we need we, uh, we, massive calculation yes, for we, many users. Actually, we have a high computing cluster, but what we are dreams about to make a real test bed with real equipment, uh, I mean, because everything that we have heard, guys uh, simulate with use of MATLAB, uh, like they already said, but we want to make some, some devices, real devices and test. And we don't have a problem with computing performance, because on the same stage we have a high, high performance cluster here, and actually we can use it. Yeah. So. Not yet. I did you test? No, I didn't test. Uh, no. no. So we, we, we can I only know that's available. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we can test we can test it if you need. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I still have questions. Yeah. Uh, have you ever considered to join the design with a MIMO system? For example, uh, for your user centric uh, system and uh, for the users uh, located on the cell air, uh, cell air area, and uh, maybe uh, you can see both, uh, both for the service cell and the neighbor cell. Uh, yes. Be, yes. So, uh, have you ever considered this? Uh, my, actually, my work is completely based on the upper layer, network and transport layer. We are dealing with the mobility. It's a physical layer, Melin is an expert of this kind of, he deals with this issue. My boy and uh, no mark one. We haven't actually done anything on massive MIMO, uh, but we have done some work on the MIMO and the space time report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Sanjay. I think if there is no further question, we move to the next slide. Uh, Udal. So, Udal talks about uh, semantic web balance applications. That's a bit apart from his current initiative studies, so it's, it's quite it's something on his own the research interest. Sometimes most of the couple of weeks. 
So these are the export models that you can transfer. And uh, when we consider the availability of experts, so since uh, they are human resources, we can't expect them to be available like 24 hours. So one solution we can suggest is how we can develop uh, a virtual expert or the expert system. So it basically, <coughs> uh, the virtual expert would act as separate human counterpart in the organization. So uh, when we consider the productivity, so we can increase the productivity because multiple users can simultaneously access this virtual system. You can simply host your application in a separate server, then uh, many people can access. So in addition to that, uh, it's cost effective because you have to pay for a more salary for uh, exact expert. But when we consider this uh, virtual system, it's just the maintenance only. And sometimes for the model engineers, you have to pay. Uh, but initially it must be high, but uh, when you continue to maintain, it could be low cost. And so when we consider this uh, external concern, sometimes uh, if the particular expertise person is not in your organization, you have to outsource your project to some other organizations. To, uh, organization. So in these situations, you can uh, consider about how uh, avoid these things with having a separate virtual expert in the organization. So in order to develop this expert system, the behind the pictures comes with the artificial intelligence and those things, but uh, when you consider it uh, build the knowledge base, so you have to use semantic web technologies. So I will explain what this uh, semantic web is. <coughs> so when we consider this computer system, actually the data, there is no meaning. So computer can't derive any meaning out of uh, any meaning from the computer data. So uh, in here the main intention is how we can teach for the machine to derive the meaning from the existing data. So uh, in this concept, the person who called Tim Burns Lee who proposed a uh, new <coughs> system that means a uh, new extension of web. For example, when we consider this web, uh, if you want to find some information, you have to use URL, that means universal resource locators. Uh, in here, in this concept, in order to find a particular resource, you have to use URIs, that means universal resource indicators, to uniquely identify the resource and stuff. So, when we consider the core concept, behind this semantic that it comes with ontology. That means uh, each and every ontology would represent separate domain knowledge. So you can link multiple ontologies and you can keep them in separate repository. <coughs> so you can uh, integrate the, those uh, different domain knowledge to perform particular tasks. And uh, there are a set of technology layers available in the existing ontology. So I will go uh, to these technology layers. So it resides in the XML because it should be uh, human readable as well as machine readable. So XML is, uh, XML is the underlying technology and there are some resource de description frameworks are there to describe the resources as well as uh, uh, you have to create semantics. So for that uh, create the relationships in between these entities you have to create ontologies or WL <coughs> and uh, you want to infer new knowledge from the constructed domain knowledge. So for that you have to add more rules and facts like established rules and things and you have to query. So once you construct the knowledge, how you are going to query it? So you have to use Spark and queries. The most uh, important thing is proof. So in here, uh, based on the logic, how we are going to provide the true outcome. And uh, <coughs> the trust means, this is the way of trust. So it implies like the uh, Whatever the provided outcome is the exact outcome. For example, let's say if you want to search something in uh, using the Google search engine, <coughs> so you have to use uh, some kind of keyword search. So it doesn't know what the meaning it is. So it gives more than one output as response. Now, when we consider the semantic view, so you uh, when you search something, if you want to get some information, it should give the exact optimal information. So uh, whatever the decision would make on behalf of you to the system. So that's why it gives only the one uh, response. For example, 
there is a semantic uh, Google, for example, Google, you can use. So, and, uh, so when I explain the user involvement, especially there are three users uh, here. Uh, domain expert is there and expert system is here. So when we consider this uh, application, there should not be any knowledge gap in between the domain expert and the constructed expert system. Because uh, even uh, the absence of this person, the expert system should be able to perform tasks uh, smoothly. So the knowledge engine is the person who is going to feed the data for the uh, expert system and knowledge user can use this system. So I will explain inside view how we can construct domain knowledge, what are the internal details, how it is going to infer your knowledge out of the constructed view. So internally there are a set of class hierarchies, so there are certain identify and then the entities, how their relationships are in the super sub levels and more generalized and specialized form. So in addition to that, uh, we have to in some kind of instances. For example, when we consider this university domain, so we can create new individual low instance as TPU and we can construct class hierarchy. <coughs> so only creating class hierarchy and things would not be enough. We have to create some kind of relationships in between these entities. So for that we have to use properties. Especially there are two types of properties you have to use, like object properties and data properties. And you have to build the relationship in this way. For example, when we consider the employee who works for organization. So when we consider the employee belongs to person class. So when we build the relationship in between the employee and the organization, so it will bind using this property called uh, works form. So it will use this information and once you create ontology, <coughs> so you can visualize uh, in this way. So it explains these relationships in between these things, which is separate properties. So you can define the cardinal ratio of these things and uh, if you want if you want to make this more informative, you have to add more properties for this one. So adding property would not be enough, you have to add new rules in order to get a new knowledge from this one. So the, that's the most important thing when we consider the constructive knowledge base, we have to do the reasoning process that, that means we want to validate uh, existing domain knowledge according to whether there are any logical contradictions. For example, when you consider the uh, software application, we have to go by in order to verify whether the written application is according to language specific grammar. So here, it's not syntactical. Validation is semantic validation. It should derive the meaning. All rules and classes and relationships will be validated and derived in from your knowledge from there. From the static ontology view, it will load the dynamic view out of it. Then it's available for human being process. So there are different tools. If you want, you can use Pellet, Urbic, Tracer. <coughs> so once you uh, create this domain knowledge and once you finish this reasoning process, now it's available for the Q&A. So you can ask questions and <coughs> derive the response so based on the written query. <coughs> so this query is not uh, like typical queries that we have to use, uh, we can use for the databases because you are going to search things to semantic way. So we have to derive new queries and you have to specify what are the uh, resources related with specifying URIs and So I will explain regarding the new uh, issues and challenges in the construct. So one thing is uh, this should be up to date. Otherwise the whole uh, domain knowledge uh, constructed uh, knowledge base will be in vain because we can't use uh, even response would not be correct. And update the knowledge base is a time consuming task because we have to modify relationships and we have to add new rules and modify these things, all these things would be time consuming activities. <coughs> and knowledge acquisition session is another 
uh, difficult task because you have to meticulously plan all uh, details that you are going to get together from particular experiments. can't get the exact responses. <coughs> so when we consider verify and when the that's also very important because when you perform this uh, knowledge acquisition session, sometimes you have to consider uh, the interview process. During the interview process, there may have a panel of domain experts. Sometimes they may give uh, contradictory information. How we are going to validate or uh, Patients are going to say about their symptoms, how that system is going to give the prescription. So now we can our area. <coughs> as soon as you can integrate this semantic web to some other areas like uh, natural language processing, uh, and uh, you can create QA systems, question and answer system, and you can use uh, you can integrate this one with machine learning techniques. So once this scenario is given into the Identify what the scenario and based on that uh, it will give some kind of uh, it will select a particular algorithm. <coughs> that. That's another <coughs> area. So and when we consider this telecommunication domain, let's say you want to send the data, sometimes they may have data traffic in particular routers and stuff. So based on the routing table, it will identify what are the other parts that you can send uh, transmit data. So that's also another area you can use. Uh, this is a very good technology. I would like to improve my presentation. Uh, that's all. Thank you. If you have questions. Can you give me some example? Sir? Example. Example. Uh, one, one example, uh, we develop like fix some kind of errors in Oracle domain, uh, uh, especially when I mean, Oracle is triggering some errors, uh, there are some situations that uh, we can feed the expert system. To the expert system, it will identify what are the scripts that you can uh, run to uh, fix the error. And sometimes you can uh, ask Q and S. Let's say once the error it happens, you can ask the question from the system. So your system would give the responses based on the facts and rules you derive in the constructed knowledge base. That's another example. And, uh, in addition to that, uh, there is a, another research area that uh, uh, we did like uh, when we consider a psychiatric assistant agent. So let's say a patient is going to tell regarding the details, uh, uh, symptoms that patient has. So then uh, based on the symptoms, it will analyze and it will identify what the exact, uh, uh, whatever the prescription or what are the things that uh, counseling uh, specific details should be given for the person. So uh, these details we can store in the solution domain and we can map it. The address will be prescription. Yeah, we have concern about the accuracy and validity regarding that one. So most probably it could uh, assist for the doctor, so not just the system. No, this is not his PhD work. His PhD work on the uh, yeah, machine learning for yeah. Noma. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, before he joined us, he was a software engineer for about five years. Mm -hmm. So he's quite an expert on uh, semantic web. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he's still working on this area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Recommendation to some 
job uh, is saying that uh, last year 81 students Tomsk uh, uh, universities uh, certified. Uh, I want to show you, for example, the example of uh, vendor cooperation. So now uh, comprehensive, uh, comprehensive training programs uh, at five main directions. For example, information specialist, support specialist, system administrator, system engineer, uh, application developer, database administration. In our experience uh, with the Microsoft company, uh, we have collaborations since uh, 2007 here uh, when we open Microsoft Innovation Center. So the uh, mission of this center is uh, creation and development of the IT business global ecosystem. So we have a network of Microsoft Innovation Center all over the globe, uh, 100 centers, uh, and uh, in Russia we have only six Microsoft Innovation Centers. Uh, our goals are the first one education, the second project activity, students project activity and innovation activity students. So our activities, uh, activities uh, is uh, different uh, IT challenge, uh, different uh, competitions, for example, of well known all over the world a metric cup competition. Unique IT project that takes the pro and many, many other activities for students. So, maybe you have any questions. We are, uh, uh, um, I want to say that uh, as a resume of my short report, that we are ready for collaboration with uh, the company and it's very interesting for us in you know, preparing students, specialists, members. Great. Any questions? Uh, uh, <coughs> related to the institution, do you have some